Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by Arc. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by Arc or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by Arc to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of Arc Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of FYI, Arc's weekly podcast. Today, we have with us author, speaker, and China tech expert Matthew Brennan, as well as Arc analyst James Wang. Matthew, thank you for joining us today. I just finished your book, uh, Tension Factory: The Story of TikTok and China's Bite Dance, and there's so much I want to get into. But first, just wanted to welcome you to the podcast and let you have the floor here and talk about kind of what you've seen with Bite Dance and TikTok over the last few years as it really has become a global company. Thank you, guys.、Uh, you know. Thank you for inviting me, and it's it's great to be here with you on the podcast today and、uh, talk about yeah, bike dance, TikTok, and and China Tech, I guess. Yeah, so let's get into it. TikTok this year has really had a moment. It's become a global phenomenon, and I think beyond just TikTok, short form video is having its moment globally. Can you kind of get into this trend and why TikTok, why bike dance, and maybe start off kind of in the early years of, of bike dance here and what. Led to their success today. Yeah, these are great questions. I mean, why TikTok? Why Bite Dance? I think that's what we really, if I could say, what the core of the of the book is, and what motivated me to write the book in the first place was to sort of answer those questions. I, I find this fascinating, right? Like, why is TikTok taking over the world? Why why couldn't Facebook build this? Why couldn't Google build this or Tencent? You know. Bike dance before short video wasn't the sort of sexiest company in China by a long way, right? They were sort of doing news aggregation, is what people knew them for back in the day. And、uh, to be honest, their their sort of flagship app in China around 2016, let's say, was this news aggregator called Toutiao. It's a household name in China, but outside China, obviously, nobody knows it, nobody uses it. It's a China-only product. But it had a pretty bad reputation for like feeding people clickbait and sort of trashy content, memes, you know, gif, cat gifs, and stuff like that. I remember we, you know, on our podcast back in the day, I think it was about 2016, 2017. We we did a interview with an analyst from Tencent about the platform, and I was pretty dismissive of them. You know, I was <laughs> like, this is just、uh, clickbait stuff, and like, it's not. It's not a very interesting platform, but the, the reason why we're talking about them was because their usage stats were crazy. Like they had the highest retention, like the highest like sort of time that people were spending in the app. It was second only to WeChat in China. Now in China, like WeChat's number one by far for like where people spend time on mobile. It's like one third of all time spent on mobile in China's in WeChat, right? So. That's why everyone calls it a super app, and that's where all the power of of Tencent comes from on mobile. But this this news aggregator was just killing it, right? It was just like the stats were crazy. People, the average user time was something like forty five to sixty minutes a day, and really that was why everyone was like, "What the hell is going on here?" So what the hell was going on was recommendation engine. Right? This、uh, Bite Dance just had this crazy powerful recommendation engine. And they'd kind of gone all in on this technology, and so that was what was powering this sort of hyper addictive news aggregation app, for which there is no real equivalent outside China. Right, the closest you could say is like the Facebook news feed, but there's no social element to it. Right, so there's no social network involved. It's just pure articles and short videos over time as well. And then when they took this recommendation engine and plugged it into short video, because the thing you have to remember is like. They were actually latecomers into short video. This company, right? Bite Dance today, when they initially started 
doing their baby steps into doing video content in 2016, everyone thought that this market was already taken. You know, musically was already huge in in the West, right? And and, and the question, one of the questions we answer in the book as well is like, why did musically not do this, right? Musically was pretty much the same user experience, but it didn't have anywhere near the same level of impact. And again, it comes back to the recommendation technology being uh, by far the, the biggest reason. Like the Musical.ly team were, did really, really well and it was a great startup, but they just didn't have this like amazing tech and this amazing back end that ByteDance did. And so if we must bring it down to one reason, you know, that's the reason. Can you talk about the relationship between Musical.ly and ByteDance? How um, there's a lot of stories like, is it a clone? Is it semi-related? Is it unrelated? How do those two play off? Yeah, great question. So uh, Musical.ly, we spend a lot of the book talking about Musical.ly, actually. It takes up a big chunk because it's a really fascinating story of what happened to them and, and, and how, how that played out. Musical.ly, you know, TikTok is, if we were to summarize it in a sentence, right? TikTok is the China version of Douyin, and Douyin is a clone of Musical.ly, and Musical.ly is a clone of an app called Mindy. So it's actually fair to say that TikTok is a clone of a clone of a clone. (laughs) It's actually very complex. You you have to see it a little bit. I've got a diagram in the book actually like laying it out and the story there. So if we can, for the the user experience today that we know as, as being TikTok, right, which we can describe as being full screen vertical video with a swipe up motion to get to the next piece of content and with music driven content discovery, This basic experience was created in a basement in Paris in 2013 by a small team of of engineers. They actually went on, that team later on went to California. They they moved over and started doing it seriously as a company. But um, they later did YOLO, which I think is a Snapchat-based startup that was pretty successful at one point. So these guys are actually pretty good product guys. I feel pretty confident that at some point in the future, they're probably going to do something quite good as well when a new opportunity arises. But yeah, these guys, these guys came up with the experience, Musical.ly cloned their app and basically built uh, their own version out of Shanghai. So the, the Musical.ly team was a very small team, actually, less than 10 people in Shanghai uh, around 2015. And their app originally didn't do very well. Um, it did okay. But, you know, it wasn't setting the world alight until Spike TV came along uh, with Lip Sync Battle. And this was around the time of Dub Smash. I don't know if you guys remember Dub Smash as well. Dub Smash became huge, I think, around 2015. It was sort of an overnight sensation of people. Uh, but the Dub Smash app is still going today. But the Dub Smash today is sort of like version 2.0, where they've completely reworked the app to be more like, more, more like TikTok. Whereas back in the day, it was just a, a Lip Sync tool is what it really was, but very successful. And Musical.ly sort of jumped on that bandwagon, went into uh, Lip Sync, and that was really the sort of the big thing for them. From that, they sort of really started to become very popular with teens in Europe and North America, as I'm sure you're well aware. And it was really just teens using that platform. Back in China, everyone was saying that Musical.ly is like sort of the kings of the overseas because back in the day... uh, Nobody really thought that Chinese could do social apps. Like there was a perception in China that we just can't do it. It's just too difficult. We don't understand the culture in America. So there's no way we could ever build an app for American teams. But Musical.ly kind of proved them wrong and came up with like quite a successful experience. And a lot of it was around challenges. They basically just worked out that doing like challenges was really, really popular and that was a great way to get people to create content and sort of lower the friction, lower the barrier to creating content, short form video content. Because, you know, this is the thing that everyone, one of the aspects that people talk about with TikTok today, right? Like is how it's okay to copy on the platform and it's okay to sort of mimic and how these memes come super popular overnight. Like, you know, like whether it's, uh, it's a lot of them are based around songs and these sort of challenges help people create content so the barrier to content creation is quite low you just have to like copy what other people are doing essentially and it's a sort of cookie cutter process where if one dance is going viral on the platform you just do your own version of that dance and it's really that simple so the, this this was actually sort of the key to to getting people to generate this content because 
really when you think about short video content, like actually making the content is not the problem. Like people know how to use the editing software. They can work that out on their phone. That's easy. And when you look at like a platform like Vine, all you really had to do is like hold down on the button and record and that's it. Like it's about as simple as you can get. The problem with Vine was not working out how to record. It was like making something interesting that people actually want to watch. That was the problem. And, and musically solved that problem through the video memes, right? The challenges that became so popular. And that's still today. I mean, that really kicked off with things like the ice bucket challenge was was a big one. Or the Harlem Shake was like the first sort of like, if you remember that one back in the day, that was YouTube in a sort of YouTube era. This is before before any of this. Uh, the Harlem Shake was like probably the first time that this sort of stuff went viral across the internet. That's a great point because I remember the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge and seeing, as you kind of describe it, everyone's own version of that original challenge. I think that kind of sparked the challenge movement, as you said. I do want to circle back here, too, because when TikTok bought Musical.ly, it did bring this powerful recommendation algorithm that it had been working on with Totiao and brought it to short form video. So I would love to just get your opinion on, you know, how is this recommendation algorithm different from others out there? I know, you know, YouTube and Netflix, they have their own versions of this. And who is maybe the closest competitor in that technological space and in, in recommendation algorithms and short form video? Because there's some other China players in the short form video space. Xiao, maybe one. So I'd love to get your opinion on that. Yeah, sure. I think what ByteDance does, it's not so much like cutting edge technology, I think the recommendation engine behind TikTok, Google could make that, Facebook could probably make that. It's not that it's like super difficult to make, it's just complex. It's a bit like Google search algorithm, right? Like making a search engine, any major technology company can do that, internet company can do that now. Like it's it's being it's commoditized technology today. What makes Google search best in class is is not that it's high, high tech, is that it's very, very complex. It's hundreds and hundreds of algorithms that have been tweaked over many, many years for all kinds of edge use cases that give the best search results you know, regarding what you want to find. And I think it's a, it's a similar case with, with what ByteDance has built over years with Douyin and now with TikTok. With, in the China market, yeah, Kuaishou is a really big player. And we didn't talk that much about Kuaishou in the book. Uh, and that was a very deliberate choice because there's no direct equivalent of Kuaishou in the North American or European markets that people are very familiar with. And so it's a little bit difficult to explain Kuaishou when people have got no reference point outside China. There actually is an app now that kind of is like it, which is called Likey. And so if you want to find out like what Kuaishou is like, then download Likey and you can use that. That's definitely a, a somewhat similar experience. But the key difference is, is that Kuaishou is more of a social network uh, in how people use it. Uh, it's a short video social network. And so it's actually very popular in lower tier cities and rural areas in China where people use it as a way to connect with their local communities. The traffic seems to be more decentralized in the way the app is set up. So that what that means is that you can sort of connect easier to people who are geographically in your city and find out you know, what, what's going on around you a little bit easier. So it's quite a different experience and we see quite different content there compared to the China version of TikTok, which inside China and outside China, there are some differences definitely in the content for sure. But uh, you know, broadly, it's, it's roughly the same. If you understand TikTok uh, in, in the States, what it is, in, you'll understand pretty quickly how it works in China. Beyond China, I think of, you know, there's a few copycats now. Triller is one. There was the founders of Vine came out with Byte. You have Instagram Reels. But looking around at those other services and platforms, they don't have the same stickiness that TikTok does. So what exactly is TikTok looking for when when you're scrolling through videos how are they matching these videos i want to get into kind of the heart of the recommendation algorithm and what makes it so different from a social graph versus it seems it's based mostly on interest and how long you view the video etc yeah well i mean it's constantly changing 
number one, right? What the algorithm is, is being constantly refined. And for sure, stuff we put in the book, I read in the book is going to be out of date by the time it comes out. Because there's, there's definitely a, we sort of alluded to it in the, in the book as well. Like there's a constant game of cat and mouse between, you know, marketers and, and, and people who want to sort of hack the algorithm and get massive exposure and the platform that wants to, you know, keep control of the sort of content ecosystem and manage these sort of bad actors. So there's this constant evolution of, of what's going on in terms of how the algorithm works in order to keep down bad actors. But with regard to how it works, I tend to think of it as there's sort of two flywheels. There's a data flywheel and there's a content flywheel that's driving everything here. And the data flywheel is based around enriching the user profile. And it's pretty similar to how Facebook newsfeed would work, I think, that based on your interactions with content, it will tag the user based on whether you're a dog lover or a Taylor Swift fan or, or whatever. And then the whole sort of bite dance system is based around matching a user profile with a content profile. So on the content side, on a, on a video side, there's also they need to tag up each video and make sure that's accurately identified. So on one side, you've got recommendation. On the other side, you've also got video classification, which is a really, really important element of the whole thing. And that sort of speaks to why an app like TikTok can only really exist in 2020 or like in basically, you know, in, in the last few years. If you go back, if you wind back even like seven years ago, the video classification technology just wasn't good enough in order to accurately tag videos that don't have good metadata. So that's a really important point. And just to elaborate on that, like if you shoot a short video of you on, well, your son on a beach with a, playing with a dog, something like that, and then you just upload it with say, hey, check this out, right? Seven, eight years ago, if you did that on YouTube, it would have a really tough time knowing what that video was if you didn't tag it properly and if you didn't add metadata and if you didn't add a description and, and things like that. If you go back, you know, 10 years, it probably wouldn't have any idea like how to, how to classify that. But TikTok, you know, when you upload a video to it, you know, it actually breaks it down frame by frame and uses quite sophisticated computer vision in order to identify the elements within the videos. So it will be able to work out there's a dog in this video, the background's a beach, uh, there seems to be a young boy in there. You know, we've got 99 point whatever statistical probability this is a boy. And, and then that automated tagging really helps with accurately matching content with users. So a lot of this stuff, and, and that also elements like the augmented reality filters tend to be quite important as well in terms of like driving engagement and usage on the platform. So, uh, you know, that all of that stuff around sort of doing these silly sort of like new filters, mm-hmm. that, that stuff is only really been possible in the in really come to, in the last few years that, you know, it's really come along. So there's a reason why we're seeing this now in terms of like it just really technologically wise even five years ago, I think it would. A lot of this stuff was a little bit too early for it to really sort of break through. Yeah, that's an inter- super interesting. I want to really get into kind of the AI's relative contribution to TikTok's success. Because some call it an AI first company or a deep learning company, and it struck me just as it did for you that Facebook and Instagram and Google. These companies mastered at least the first wave of using deep learning neural nets for content recommendation. To what degree do you think, I guess everyone has AI, but TikTok uniquely has its market presence. So how do you think about that? And is it, I mean, I'm kind of inclined to think that AI is a component, but you need to master multiple things to catch escape velocity. Escape velocity. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we've been talking about the technology mostly today, but like, I think equally equally as important, arguably more important, <laughs> is uh, ByteDance's ability to growth hack. They really, yeah, I mean, that's not talked about enough. Sounds like greatest growth hacking team since the original early Facebook team. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think they're, they're highly capable. And there's some exclusive stuff in the book that people don't know yet about like what they did in the States. At least I haven't read anyone or seen anyone talk about it that we got from our contacts at ByteDance. 
about how they growth hacked the Western markets in terms of like, if you were on YouTube in 2018, you couldn't have gone anywhere without seeing a TikTok ad, right? Or it's the same for Snapchat and Facebook. I think they just flooded everywhere with adverts. And so what they did there, you know, in terms of like using the user generated content and systematically testing that was quite unusual, I would say, an unusual strategy, not, not uh, unorthodox, perhaps you could say. Definitely unorthodox because none of the Western social media companies grew to their current sizes by advertising their way to success. They, they grew organically. They certainly didn't go on someone else's platform or TV to say, hey, use our stuff. Exactly. I mean, but that's the reality of the mobile world we live in today. I mean, the sad reality is you can have a killer product. I mean, TikTok, I would say, is a compelling user experience and a best-in-class product, but that's not good enough. You need to spend boldly and fast. In 2018, I think ByteDance knew they, they had something special. And they also knew that they needed to move extremely fast in order to take this window of opportunity. You know, they're scared of Facebook and Google copying this. You know, they're also scared of Chinese companies doing this as well and, and sort of overtaking them. They're, they're very much aware that they need to move fast. And that's what they did. And, and so that's why you saw those platforms absolutely flooded with adverts. And it actually went a little bit too far. What we talk about in the book is like it had unintended consequences. Then if you know back in sort of 2018, the sort of reputation of TikTok in the North American market when it first came out was one of basically being a, a cringe app, right? Like everyone said like this app is super strange. It's full of adults doing like weird stuff. And <laughs> I don't know why anyone would use this app. This is like, it was not cool at all. It was just, it was the opposite of cool. Everyone was calling it out. You can go onto YouTube and if you look at any compilation from TikTok from the period of 2018, they are all cringe compilations. Everyone was dissing the platform and saying this thing's just a complete, you know, the, basically the perception of TikTok that it, it wasn't a threat to Google or Facebook. It was, it was the only thing it was a threat to was itself uh, in terms of like, <laughs> destroying its reputation before it even got going. So what changed? What, how did its reputation take a turn and become the coolest thing that only kids use? Well, I mean, I think there was a lot of discussion internally. I mean, we didn't go into it in the book because I, I can't source it. And some people, you know, said things off the record to us that I can't really put in. But there was a lot of discussion internally, <laughs> put it that way. I think they realized that, you know, they, certainly the American team realized that there was something wrong with this and they did actually stop the massive ad spend quite suddenly actually. And they did manage to move it around. I mean, in the end, it is a compelling product. They did start advertising again, but I think there was a, a sort of a moment that they were sort of on the edge of going, of destroying the reputation of the product before they even got a chance in the market. Fortunately, it is a compelling product. And uh, one of the advantages they do have, because it's totally algorithmically surfaced content to the user is that if you have a platform that's all teenagers and preteens doing lip sync and dance videos, which is what they inherited from, from TikTok, uh, sorry, from, from Musical.ly rather, they actually have the power to manipulate what people see into thinking that, you know, maybe our platform's 99% lip sync and dance, but we can make sure that the 1% that's actually the content we want on the platform and the kind of content that we want people to see and, and start making, we can get sh ensure that that gets massive exposure, right? And then if you're, if you're doing lip sync and dance, you just bury that content with the algorithm. And that's exactly what they did. <laughs> so uh, that, that, that helped a lot. Matt, I want to bring this to present day. Is TikTok's growth trajectory and, and you know, this viral sensation that it has become, is this sustainable? And who today is the biggest threat? Is it Instagram's Reels copycat? You know, Instagram has shown time and time again, they can copy and do it successfully. They did it to Snapchat with stories. They're trying to do it with Reels today. But what is TikTok's biggest threat today? And is, it, is this sustainable? Well, yeah, the biggest threats are definitely a political threat. But we don't really cover that in the book too much because I think it's just it's not what the what we're trying to 
focus on really and it's out of my area of expertise and it's it's also very it's going to be out of date like in in days right like we don't know what's going to happen with the election coming up and, and things like that so mm -hmm. um, i mean just in like you know tiktok got banned in in pakistan i don't know if you know it got banned in pakistan and then just just today it got unbanned it was also banned in indonesia for a while so i think we're going to see that all over the world that with content-based platforms that there's going to be political risk but i I'm, I'm just in the book and today I, you know i can speak to the sort of competitive dynamics between ByteDance and other internet giants and, and what the risks would be there. So um, we've seen that China, I think, is the window into the future here because if you squint hard enough, there's a lot of nuance, but basically what's happened in China has played out quite similar all over the world. So in China today, there's like 600 million daily active users on the Chinese version of TikTok. That's over half of all internet users in China, right? So <laughs> over half the internet users in China are opening up TikTok on a daily basis. I don't think that's an unreasonable situation to be happening in North America in a year or two, that this still has a long way to go, is my general sort of thinking here. I think that it's a super compelling experience. And although the content has a lot of differences, I think it's worked extremely well all over the world. And with China being about 18 months ahead, I think it's the best indicator of where this is going to go in the next 18 months in that it's still going to grow and grow, that there's a lot, large number of sort of older users, middle-aged people, seniors who can still come on board. I'll just give you a personal anecdote here, right? Like my mother-in-law in China, she's like what, in her 60s now, maybe early 60s. And she's like a daily user of the TikTok version there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, something I would totally never expect. <laughs> I was just like <laughs> shocked that like, and like she's creating videos on there, like not just passively watching, but like creating short videos on the Chinese version of TikTok. I was, I was stunned when I found that out, but I don't think that's unusual now. That's, that's the kind of user that's being onboarded now in China, right? Because they've just reached everyone who's young and everyone who's sort of middle-aged, that all the growth will come from sort of older users and people in more rural areas. So yeah, this has got a long way to go. I think this is just a general internet trend. Like short video is very compelling. And if TikTok gets banned in America, let's say it will be someone else. You know, It will be Triller or it will be Reels. This thing is just a, such a compelling format that I can't see why it wouldn't work all you know it, in, in North America to a similar to a similar degree. There's also a question around e-commerce as well, right? Like so, in the China market, e-commerce has become quite successful on on the Chinese version of TikTok, whether that's live stream e-commerce or whether that's short video e-commerce. Because the, actually the Chinese version has a lot of live stream in it now as well. And so definitely we can expect that. I, I'd be quite surprised if TikTok doesn't do that in 12 months, let's say. I, I think like in Southeast Asia, they're already doing that. So that would be a user behavior. Uh, I think that would we can expect. And, you know, for why would a company like Walmart want to invest in TikTok? I think that answers the question quite clearly. If you know what's happening in China with e-commerce on, on the TikTok there, then there's quite clearly a role for Walmart to play in enabling e-commerce to happen in, on TikTok in North America. So we'll have to see if that deal actually comes through and, and what would be the terms. Maybe, maybe they won't be involved in that way, but there's clearly potential for them to be involved in that way. So I think we can expect to see that all come through. Right now, is just so much uncertainty around the sort of ownership of it that that needs to be answered first before you know all of this can come. With Reels, you mentioned before, like I think Reels is so far seems I don't know you guys I don't I can't even use Reels so I don't I, I can't speak as a user of like what the experience is. But what I'm hearing is it's pretty bad. I guess that will improve over time. But like, have you guys used it? What's your personal opinion? Yeah, I've I've been going back and forth just to kind of understand the dynamics between the two, between Reels and, and TikTok. And I think, you know, early days of Reels, 
you saw a lot of famous TikTokers on Reels just reposting the TikTok. And you could tell this because there was the watermark that would jump from the left side to the right side. I think a lot of that has kind of subsided or, you know, maybe Reels is pushing those videos down in terms of of reach. But I still see, at least from my own feed, I'm seeing not new creators or someone I haven't yet discovered on Instagram. I'm seeing people that I'm already, I've already recognized, you know, household name celebrities. And that's one of the differences, I think, between Instagram and TikTok. TikTok, if you're a new creator or an old creator that didn't have success on Instagram or YouTube, TikTok was a, is and can still be a lottery ticket to fame. You can have one video blow up overnight and reach a massive audience. And you didn't, you still don't need that many followers because it is just content driven. If the content piques interest in a niche area or a larger audience, you have that success. And I just haven't seen that translated on the Reels platform. But that could just be, you know, my view. Uh, it may be different for other users, but that's, yes, that's what I've seen. Yeah. So I, I guess without using Reels myself, so I, I'm a little bit like hesitant to judge with, you know, I'm saying anything about products that I don't use. I, I usually try and avoid that. But with what we saw in the China market, right? Tencent tried to clone TikTok in, in China and they couldn't. And they tried really hard. <laughs> they tried really hard. And so when people were saying, you know, what's Facebook going to do? Facebook's going to try and, you know, build their own clone and like they'll be able to match TikTok. I've always been like really, really hesitant like, and suspicious of that line of thinking because, uh, you know, in China from Spring Festival 2018, so like January 2018, the whole industry knew that this was huge. Like it suddenly blew up like crazy and everyone scrambled to copy it. Everyone. And a company like Tencent has just got so many resources and they just threw money at this, crazy money at it. Like within two weeks, they had like a team of hundreds of people working on it, right? And then they sort of announced we've got this, our version called Weisha, which they immediately said, this is a strategic product for the whole company. And what that means in Tencent is like, this thing's a huge deal. It means like that's on like sort of WeChat level, strategic product. Like they don't, that's a very, very like, rarely used label which sort of indicates to everyone that like this is a huge deal like we need to get behind this product because they were actually very very scared of this and and rightfully so i mean it's proved that they actually should have been scared of it because uh it's it's definitely had a a, quite a big impact on their business so that's why i'm sort of i feel like facebook's gonna have a very tough time like the chinese companies are very sort of aggressive in copying in each other aggressive in how they combat each other and if they can't work out a way to clone this thing i really doubt that silicon valley companies will be able to do it that's a great point and i want to switch gears here for a second go back to something you had touched on and, and something that we have been researching as well and that is the live streaming market and specifically the trend of live streaming e-commerce what is it about this format in live streaming that makes it such a great channel to sell goods on i think it's really taken off in china we haven't yet really seen it in the us i know amazon's tried it they had this prime day i believe you know one of the main tabs there was amazon live but it hasn't taken off so much outside of the us and then we've talked a lot on tiktok and ByteDance, but what are other trends you're seeing beyond you know live streaming e-commerce. I'd love to just get your opinion there as well. Yeah, sure. It's a great question because I've really struggled with live stream e-commerce. Like I say, I really want to understand all this stuff as a user. And if I don't understand it as a user, then I'm really uh, hesitant to say anything on it. So I've been trying to buy stuff on Chinese e-commerce. Well, I have been buying stuff rather on Chinese e-commerce live stream apps for most of this year. And trying to understand what makes it compelling because to be honest when it's kicked off i really did not find this compelling and i was quite suspicious of it and being like this is just hype from alibaba because alibaba does that sometimes they hype up things that just aren't for the their pr is pretty strong and they're, they're actually quite able to get people to talk about things that aren't things <laughs> so, not i mean not just alibaba's the worst but like there are other not, it's not just that and in the China market, there is a lot of sort of bubbles of stuff that people end up overhyping. 
So I think it has been overhyped, but not. It, there's definitely something there. Basically, the reason why people use e-commerce live streaming in China is the expectation that there will be an amazing deal that you cannot get anywhere else. That if you stick around on that live stream, you're going to be able to buy something at an amazing price. Without that heavy discounting on goods, I don't think you would see the same behavior.、Hmm. And yeah, there's a lot of brands that are being sort of burned in this in terms of like they are shipping out goods to these live stream platforms at a really heavy discount. It's actually been exposed recently in China how much of the audiences on these platforms is a、uh, fake engagement. It's all just bot accounts watching it, and the Chinese version of TikTok took a lot of action against this a couple of a month or two ago, I think. And、uh, the numbers on many of these sort of live stream audiences just fell by like an order of magnitude, from like a thousand down to ten or something, like tens of people, right? In terms of, it was mostly bot traffic inflating the views and. A lot of these are run by MCNs, and the MCNs organize it so they actually buy most of the goods themselves. So the audiences are fake, and then the goods are mostly being bought back by the companies that manage the KOLs. So it is a very murky world. But underneath all this, there is, you know, there is something. I don't want to give you the impression that this is all sort of like a totally fake, a sort of bubble that's going to burst. There is something here, yeah. This can be compelling, and it is a long-term trend, but it's it's certainly being inflated at the moment. I feel we、we'll、have to see how it, how、uh, I think let it die down for next year and see how it goes. Interesting. Would you say that sticking around for discounts is one of the reasons also that a company like Pinduoduo that offers you know group discounting for the masses? Had such early success and continues to have such success, and that they've kind of pioneered. Even though you know the founder has come out and said social commerce, this idea doesn't really exist.、Mm. But you know, I think there's that's probably the best way to describe that kind of trend where you're blending social aspects with with e-commerce. Would you also say that that discounting mechanism is a reason that they had so much success? Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I think today that's still a big part of Pindoro. People know that Pindoro is the cheapest platform, and value is the sort of core. When I say value, I mean price value is, is the sort of core people thing that people identify with Pindoro. But actually, that's you know that's how Taobao started as well. The Alibaba empire in its early days was built around Taobao. Still today, Taobao is the most popular app, the most important property after Alipay. But Taobao in the early days was filled with fake goods and knockoff brands, and that was how it built its reputation. And it changed over time. And I expect Pindoro to go through the same transformation, but that transformation will take many years, as it did with Taobao. But they're stuck in a sort of situation today, where in the early days with Pindoro, they had this amazing growth hack. Right, they were able to ride the wave of mini programs and WeChat opening up all this traffic to foster e-commerce and, and usage of WeChat Pay. This window of opportunity, which they grabbed so well and grew from like zero to one so fast, and then through to like where they are today as a hundred billion dollar valuation company. But there is a question over where do they go from here? It's sort of undeniable that they can't grow as fast. There's just no way for them to keep growing at that speed, and the users they do have are price sensitive. That's undeniable. But having said that, you know I think you can't use the sort of traditional way to think about them in terms of e-commerce marketplaces because they do have a slightly different model. It's more about, as we wrote in a white paper this year, like what, what they term interactive e-commerce. Where, because the founding team is from the gaming industry, I think they have a slightly different mindset around how this works. In that, it is a platform where your men come back every day. They're really trying to foster a sort of daily usage habit around casually scrolling through a feed and occasionally buying a low-priced item. So, of course, the average price that you see people of goods being sold on the platform is quite low, and that's because. That's the sort of user behavior that they're encouraging, 
And over time, they need to sort of raise that and raise that slowly and sort of foster a different type of user behavior, one that's worked for higher, higher priced items. Uh, and that's not going to happen overnight, right? That's going to be a multi-year project that they need to take on board. And that's exactly what they're doing. If you use their platform today, it's, it's sort of like they're, they're going in the direction of becoming more and more like Taobao. So I think the, the direction for them is clear, but they are going to have a tough time. You know, they're competing with Alibaba and that's not easy. Alibaba is a hyper-aggressive company that's known for being very good at operations and they will use all kinds of tactics above and board and below board and they've got the deepest pockets in China. And Alibaba head office, you know, Pindodor is enemy number one, two and three right now. You know, they're not so scared of JD. JD is like not growing super fast and they're at the high end of the market and they've been there for a while and, and so they kind of know where JD is and it's sort of like there's a sort of stability in that rivalry, whereas Pindodo is kind of growing a bit too fast. And it's this sort of bottom-up disruption that's happening where like if you come in at the bottom of the end of the market, they can actually be quite powerful. So uh, for Alibaba, they, they're doing everything they can to sort of keep this company down. And, and in China, that means that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> mm-hmm. well, it's interesting how like with Alibaba, they're sort of fighting a battle on two fronts right now where they're fighting Pindoro. Pindoro is probably the main battle. But on the other side, they're also fighting Meituan. So Meituan and Pindoro are kind of like friends <laughs> because uh, they're kind of, uh, sort of fighting the same enemy, but from very different areas, right? Meituan is sort of what we call local services, I guess would be the term today that people use. So that they're in a... Alibaba sees that as a, sort of a very, very critical battlefield, that, that sort of must-win area, but they're not winning it. Actually, Meituan is doing quite well. So we'll have to see. But this dynamic of this battle on the two fronts with Alibaba is, is a really interesting dynamic right now. Maybe we can just spend a minute on Meituan. They went, Meituan, of course, is famous for food delivery in China. It's the world's largest food delivery company, larger than everyone else in the, in the world combined and then some. And Alibaba obviously saw this in a similar vein, similar threat as the PDD against their e-commerce division. They spent a lot of money on Lama. And they've held on to share. I don't that maybe gained lost some. Why haven't they been able to spend their way to success there? And what has Meituan done right that's helped them kind of continue to be on the up trajectory? I also want to tack on an additional question here with Meituan and kind of this idea of super apps and why it's only unique to China and not elsewhere in the world, right? We don't see this in the US market. So would love if you could touch there as well. Yeah, these are great questions. I'll, I'll speak to the super app one, I guess, first. The whole concept of the super app, I think, is somewhat overblown. And maybe I've done my part in the past to cause that, regrettably. I think that in China, there really is only one super app, and that's WeChat. And anything else is not really a, a super app. It's not this big innovation that people make it out to be. It's really just about user acquisition costs at the end of the day, rather than launch a new app and have to acquire users for a new app, which is incredibly expensive in 2020, right? Or even two, three years ago, it's incredibly expensive. You just embed that service in your already existing app. That's really what's going on here in terms of why Meituan or Alipay or even WeChat is bundling so many services into one app is that you don't have to acquire those users again. That's really the logic from the company. It's not that, you know, if you believe that it's, if it was cheaper to acquire users for a new app, they would just have a hundred different apps. <laughs> it really, from these companies' perspective, it's all just about user acquisition costs. That's all they're really thinking about. So that's why we see this uh, so much. And Chinese users tend to be more accepting of having so many different services bundled into one app. So there is, there is that to say. I think mean, there's a cultural difference as well. And there's that element that maybe a North American user would find that annoying or strange to have so many disparate services offered in one space. Whereas in China, there's, there's definitely more acceptance around that. With WeChat, there's actually, I think WeChat can claim to be a super app in terms of like, it is actually quite amazing how the app has so many services in it but yet doesn't feel cluttered. So they've actually done quite an amazing job there. 
And, and they've been able to do that because there's so much activity that happens in WeChat groups and in, in conversations. So when we talk about things like mini programs, really what that's leveraging is the whole thing about how in China there's so much attention in WeChat groups and in, in individual one-on-one -on -one chats on WeChat. And so that's what they're really trying to leverage there. Um, they can't really put adverts into that user experience well. You know, if you try and put adverts into a messaging app, it just really it creates a really terrible user experience. So uh, they have to be more smarter about it. They can put adverts on their moments newsfeed, you know, which is somewhat similar to a typical you know, scrolling newsfeed like Facebook or Instagram. But that's only a, a single digit percentage of time spent on WeChat. By far, the most time is spent in, in messaging. So they have to make all these services work in a messaging environment, which is really tough, really tough. But they, I think Tencent's done a really smart and, and clever job on, on making that work. When you look at other messaging apps like Line in Japan or KakaoTalk in South Korea, they haven't had anywhere near the same level of success that WeChat has in terms of making that work and monetizing that. Uh, and partly that's due to the payments. I think that the story of WeChat Pay is, uh, and Alipay is quite unique and maybe other markets aren't able to do that. Sorry, what was the other question? I've forgotten already. The, uh, <laughs> something about Meituan, going back to Meituan. Yeah, so it's about how Meituan actually continued to gain share in food delivery and local services despite this onslaught from uh, Alibaba. Yeah, most people ascribe that to Wang Xing, the founder who is incredibly capable entrepreneur. I think he's in China respected as one of the smartest and savviest entrepreneurs in all of China. And they've been able to know which battles to fight and which battles to leave. So that's how what most people say is that he's just an incredibly savvy operator. I think they're squeezing the little guys, the mom and pop stores quite heavily. You know, that at the end of the day, these stores, they go where the traffic is. And the fact is Meituan has the most traffic. Like they dominate about two thirds of that market. So if you go with them, you are going to get more orders. And so they've played that card quite heavily. They, for them, it's more about keeping that market share, that dominance. And that involves a lot of sort of like on the ground operations of really sort of hitting the ground with people and speaking to these stores and incredibly in incentivizing them to actually stick with you or locking them into deals where they can't leave for your rivals. There's a lot of sort of these details around how you manage the platforms. Remember these platforms, you know, they manage tens of thousands of drivers, right, across China that they've got this huge manual workforce that that's every day is going out and hitting the roads. And there's so many dirty tricks that are going on behind the scenes with all this stuff of like, they're trying to sort of hack each other's systems or, or steal each other's drivers and things like that. And so it really requires a really, really heavy amount of really solid operational expertise uh, and being really, really efficient about that, creating very strong HR systems, et cetera, and things like that. So, Meituan and, and, and Wang Xing have proved themselves really, really capable in building that kind of operation, operational expertise. And so you've got to give it to them. I think it's a hard-earned victory and it's a constant battle because, yeah, money does work, right? If you throw money at, at this and subsidy battles are expensive but effective, that's why they get used so much in China. Uh, the consumers will... Chinese consumers are pretty fickle <laughs> at the end of the day. They will, if it's a deal on the other platform, they will just move to the other platform. I totally agree. I remember listening to the CEO of Meituan Monsing speak uh, in Mandarin, and it was instantly night and day versus anything I've heard versus any other CEO. He had a cerebral quality about him that was completely unique, really made an impression on me. I guess if we zoom out from here, you know, China has had its first global mega success app. Facebook is even scared. It's their moment in the sun. It's their victory to lose. How big do you think ByteDance as an organization could be? Could this be a company at its endpoint larger than Facebook? And has this cultural phenomenon of them succeeding overseas changed their internal attitudes of what they can achieve? And do you see 
I guess, newer companies, smaller companies now emerging that could potentially be successful overseas as well? In other words, is Tencent one of a kind or is it the first among many overseas success stories to come? Well, in 2018, at the end of that year, I remember we did a podcast and I record, I said, I made the prediction that if they could break the uh, US market, then ByteDance would be the next Facebook in terms of being half, at the time, half a billion dollar valuation. I think that's, that the prediction holds up still today. I, I think it can be a Facebook level organization, uh, sort of valuation and size. It's quite similar to Facebook in that when we look at Apple or Google, so Amazon's definitely different, right? Like it's e-commerce, but like Google has Android. So I think that makes it quite different in terms of it's a gatekeeper for all of these uh, mobile devices around the world. That puts it in a really, really strong position that Facebook doesn't have any of that you know, safety. Facebook is just an app, right? At the end of the day, all they do is run apps. They're sort of on this layer above where Apple and, and Google are. So that's, that's a, in the long term, a, a little bit more dangerous place to be. And all of the Chinese companies, I guess, are like that, right? Where the big smartphone platforms, you know, they, they don't run, you know, if you're Tencent, if you're ByteDance, even if you're Alibaba, you're, you're sitting on top of this infrastructure. And that's inherently a less safe place to be uh, in the long term. But I think certainly ByteDance, what we can expect from them is they will use TikTok as a beachhead in order to roll out other services. Now, this is what all the Chinese companies do, right? So they're much more aggressive and they will move into so many different disparate internet services that I think a Silicon Valley company would just think that this is far too messy and you're sort of going into, why would you go into so many different areas who are just sort of like diffusing your attention and it doesn't make sense to be doing so many things at the same time you're just going to overload your the, the higher management with too many problems but chinese companies tend not to think like that they think it's, they're sort of super paranoid and they're always concerned about being disrupted and so therefore if they like to be in every market they have a position in every sort of internet services area that they can in order to sort of reduce the risk of potential disruption in the future and short video is a great example of that because nobody really thought that short video would be that important. If you go back to 2017, um, there's no way that I would or anyone else would have predicted that short video could have been so big and that the next game changing in a platform would be a clone of Musical.ly. Like, there's no way. Like, if you said to me, a clone of Musical.ly is going to be this do world dominating app in two years' time, I'd be like laughing. No way. <laughs> and so, what that speaks to is how volatile internet services can be and how for the sort of competitive dynamics between these companies can change so fast. And so that's why they're, that's, I think, a core logic behind why you diversify your offerings so much. So with ByteDance, you know, they're moving heavily into education. They're moving heavily into gaming. They're doing, obviously, enterprise productivity with Lark uh, is a big thing for them as well. They're registering things for payments. They tried to move into messaging already in China with, uh, with an app called Doshan. There's so many examples of how they're moving into different spaces. And if you look at who they're hiring on LinkedIn, uh, it's pretty clear how ambitious they are and how many areas they're going to be moving into shortly. So what we can expect from them is they will use the ad inventory that they have on TikTok in order to build out a family, a suite of applications which we see already in China. In the report I put out, and also in the book, there's a list of all the apps, all the major apps um, that ByteDance has. And in China, it's something like 30, I think, 30, 40 apps that they have in the market at one time. And I wouldn't be surprised if you saw a similar number outside China. Having said that, you know, the trend actually internationally for them has been to shut down apps recently. I think just because of the political risk at the moment, things like News Republic, Obviously, in India, they lost a, a few apps with what happened there. But we're, they've actually, Top Bars was, was another good example, They're actually shutting them down because these apps are just so small compared to TikTok now, but they hold political risk and they hold sort of media risk that it's really not worth them operating it. It's my take on what they're doing. I don't know if that's, uh, I haven't had that 100% confirmed, but I think that's that would be 
Uh, if I was them, I would probably do the same thing. But then after that, I think they'll move into sort of less politically sensitive areas like enterprise productivity or, or gaming, for example, is what we can really expect for them. But they're a Chinese company. You know, Tencent can't do that. Tencent would love to do that, <laughs> but they can't. They don't have the user acquisition channels, right? They, can, they don't have the ad inventory. If they want to do that, they need to pay Google. They need to pay Facebook in order to target those users. And so that's not a great place to be because you give all your data to those companies and it's expensive. Whereas ByteDance doesn't need to do any of that now. They can just, okay, we launch a game, we license a game, or uh, if we want to drive down some downloads of Lark, well, we can just allocate some of our massive inventory of advertisement that we already have on TikTok to do that. And, and even for something like Lark, which is uh, an enterprise productivity tool, it makes sense to do that today. It wouldn't have done a few years ago when it's the, user, the demographics on it are so young. But today, the demographics are becoming more and more like Instagram or, or Facebook, where you know, you've got people of a working age who are on there watching content that's you know, not mindless comedy. There's all kinds of content on there. So you can target users for all different kinds of internet services now. Yeah, I never thought about the fact that they can use their own ad inventory to growth hack their next app. That hasn't, that's so obvious, yet when I think back to the first wave of Web 2.0, that didn't really happen. You didn't have kind of like, sure, Facebook tried to help Instagram by a few things, but it, I didn't really see Instagram ads all over Facebook as a means of helping it grow. But it just, it, that, that mechanic didn't seem to exist before. Yeah. So on the China version of TikTok now, you know, I, because I've got a, a five year old daughter. I see about half the ads I see now, now are for ByteDance K-12 education apps for preschool and sort of kindergarten age kids because they, they tagged me on that correctly. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm always seeing ads for their educational products now. Incredible, incredible. So what about, well, ByteDance is obviously going to, I agree, it's their game to screw up and everything is working in their favor and they have their own ad inventory to help themselves. It's a perfect virtuous circle. How has this changed, if it has changed any attitudes within the China tech ecosystem and the community? And do you see greater ambition, willingness, and capability to do more of this? Well, there's kind of two things going on. I think the success of ByteDance has been very encouraging for Chinese companies to like finally have a global breakout hit. On the other hand, the political backlash has been very discouraging. Right, So pretty much overnight, ByteDance wasn't the only company doing well in India, right? There were many. And I know personally a couple of you know, small VCs who were doing really well, but they saw like their sort of flagship investments got reduced to zero overnight. That's pretty tough. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's a tough pill to swallow, right? So, yeah, I think they're much, much more wary of the potential risks of being Chinese and then building these properties in markets where they can see all of their efforts reduced to zero overnight. So there's actually a lot more wariness around, do we actually want to go into Western markets now? That's a legitimate question that wasn't there maybe 18 months ago. So we'll have to see. I think a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of VCs are really looking more inwardly focused now towards the China market. Certainly India was, I think, even more than the US, India was, was the big one there. Just because in the US, I think ByteDance, you know, they might still be able to cut a deal. And uh, I think there is due process in terms of sort of how it works legally. And we'll have to see, you know, Trump is also a bit of an anomaly, right? Like he's not a, it's not a, exactly the usual situation in the White House at the moment. So there are sort of extenuating circumstances. But in, in, with India, it's sort of a very instructive example of how, um, how in other markets, things can change rapidly. And then China doesn't have great PR over the world, right? Like uh, China doesn't do soft power very well. <laughs> so it's really an unfortunate situation, I think, for a lot of outwardly focused Chinese companies because they really, a lot of them are like the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. Like they're just like Mark Zuckerberg. They're just, you know, like people, they're just geeks who want to build stuff and they're very optimistic about the sort of value that technology can bring to the world. And think about their products and services in, in sort of similar ways to how you would expect to, you know, as typical Silicon Valley founder to be. These guys aren't very political. They're not politically motivated, typically. They, they just want to build products. Right. That's the same as, as, as you find in the West. 
but they have to deal with the reality of, of the world we live in today. And there is a rivalry and, and there is a sort of the Internet is sort of like splintering up right now. And I don't think that trend's going to go away. Matthew, this has been great. I think this is a good place to stop. And hopefully we can you know, get another podcast scheduled down the line because there's so much more about the China tech scene that I think you can teach us all here. So thank you so much for coming on, James, as well. And everyone have a good day. Thanks a lot, Matt. Yeah. Thanks, guys. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.